Hey y'all, welcome to the channel. Today we're checking out Internet versus Ocean, the essential wires we never think about. Can you imagine a world without the internet? Yes, yes. and it was marvelous. <laughs> welcome to Map Men. We're the men, and here's the map. Map Men, Map Men, Map, Map, Map Men, Men. Although most of us use the internet at least every other day, nobody understands how it works. All we know is that it's very big, very clever, very important, and impossible to show on a map. True. Then why are we doing an episode about it? Because I was lying. Take a look at this map. It shows all the undersea cables that connect the world's computers, oh. and looking at this map reveals a surprising amount about how the modern world works. I guess I thought we used satellites for most of it. I didn't realize there were actual lines. I knew that there were lines between the United States and England, but I didn't know we had all this other stuff going on. Whilst we can't wait to show you all the weirdest and wonderfulest bits of this exciting chart, before the geography lesson, <laughs> we need to put the globes that fell off the wall back on the wall and then give you a quick history lesson. How did they do that? For the vast majority of human history, a message could only travel as fast as a human, meaning it was normal to wait days or even months to receive a very important message. Very slightly faster <laughs> methods did exist. Smoke signals, water clocks, beacons, flags. But these only worked for predetermined messages. If you wanted to send a completely original thought, such as Thursday my dungarees fish basket holly bobs, that was impossible. Until... Thursday my dungarees fish basket holly bobs. What's a basket holly bob? Oh, holiday? I don't know. I think he's just, he's pulling a chain. But these only worked for predetermined messages. If you wanted to send a completely original thought, such as Thursday my dungarees fish basket holly bobs, that was impossible. Until... In 171777, a French chap called Claude Schapp <laughs> invented a way to send long distance. What year? In 171777, a French chap called Claude Schapp invented a way to send long distance messages using an alphabet made up of symbols that could be seen from a very long way away. Oh. On a hilltop, one person operated a machine that could rotate the position of two large sticks. And on another hilltop, a second person would copy the shape, relaying it onto the next hill, and so on and so on, until it was finally decoded at the other end. Schapp called his system the telegraph, from the French no telegraph, from the Greek telegraph. It was now possible to send a message from Paris to Lille in just 12 minutes rather than the usual 12 hours. Sacre bleu! At its peak, the French telegraph network looked like this. This is the earliest example of a physical network built to transmit information at high speeds across long distances. Really? It was the beginning of the internet. So they had this network of towers that had these little sticks on them? That's amazing. I've never heard of that. I thought the first telegraph was the boop, 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 Morse code stuff. It was the beginning of the internet. So why aren't we still using mechanical telegraphs today? Bad question. The flaws were oh. obvious. It only worked in the daytime, it only worked in good weather, and it required lots of highly trained workers who were vulnerable to mistakes and bribery. Thankfully, long distance messaging was a necessary huge leap forward in the 1830s, when a pair of British inventors had a much better idea. The electric telegraph. Yes. The electric telegraph sent pulses of electricity across copper wires that could be stretched pretty much any distance. It was the beginning of the internet. A contraption like this, which by the way would be an awesome clue in an escape room, was used to convert these electric pulses into almost every letter of the alphabet. <laughs> almost? So they couldn't do a C, J, Q, U, X, or Z and no numbers. And then a very clever man called Samuel Morse, named after Morse code, invented an easy to learn alphabet made up of and Morse code was a massive improvement. It only needed two Ys instead of six, you could finally send messages quickly, and you could finally spell quickly. Morse code <laughs> became a vital tool for the military, government, railways, journalism, and big business. <laughs> but if Morse code was going to achieve the absolute world domination it was surely destined for, one final hurdle had to be overcome. The Wet Susan. The most significant advance in telegraph technology came in 1850, when the aptly named English Channel Submarine Telegraph Company Boring nervously laid the first cable under the sea, desperately hoping they wouldn't electrocute all the fish. To the relief of Haddock everywhere, it worked. The world's first submarine telegraph in the English Channel successfully allowed communication across the sea between two wow. countries. It was the beginning of the internet. <laughs> By the mid-19th <laughs> century, two that. enormous networks had grown in Europe and America. The next logical step was to connect these two networks together, 
But the Atlantic Ocean was very, 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 very big. Nobody knew how telegraph technology could traverse it. Until, that is, an American businessman with a beard and no moustache, called Cyrus Westfield, finally figured it out. We need a very, 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 very long cable. It seems like an obvious idea, but it also seems almost impossible to lay a very, 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 very long cable across the ocean. But laying a very, 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 very long cable under the ocean presented some unique challenges. It took several failed attempts to lay a cable that worked. The first cable wasn't long enough. The second cable snapped. The third cable fell in the water. The fourth cable wasn't compatible with the fifth cable and couldn't be joined up in the middle. Finally, four years later, Cyrus's first transatlantic cable was complete. The fifth try? They got it on the fifth try. Is that right? Okay, sort of six times. I would have given up after the third try. Finally, four years later, Cyrus's first transatlantic cable was complete. On August the 16th, 1858, Queen Victoria sent the very first <laughs> transatlantic text message, reading, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace and goodwill toward men. <laughs> and it was sent to President James Buchanan. At just two minutes per letter, the message was received in little over 17 hours. The cable stopped working after just a few weeks, but it didn't matter. The technology oh was God. proven possible. It stopped working after a few weeks? I would have given up then. So it took six tries of laying the cable. Then the cable, that, the sixth cable worked for a couple weeks. I would not. I would not. I'm not made for that world. The very same cable laying technology was used to lay more and more cables all over the world, each one more reliable than the last, which grew into the phone network, which grew into the internet. It was the beginning of the internet. <laughs> cable laying is done pretty much the same way today. Drop it in. Only nowadays, when the cable's nearer the shore, they tend to bury it a bit for good measure. But the one big difference is what's in the wires. A modern subsea internet cable is about as thick as a human garden hose. Really? The business bit carrying the actual data is a tiny bunch of fiber optic cables. It's coated in a protective layer of polyethylene, copper sheathing, aluminium or steel wires according to taste, and lovingly smothered in Vaseline. Really? No, it's not. That's not true. That can't be true. I gotta look that up. <gasps> there is Vaseline in them. Oh my god. That's wild. They're also really small. I thought they would be like the size of a horse. Five minutes and 17 seconds to cover the entire history of long distance communication, and we didn't miss a single detail out. What about radio? Which means we are now finally ready to take a good look <laughs> at the gorgeous map of all the undersea cables that exist today. This delightful, colorful map from telegeographysubmarinecablemap.com is a true map of the internet. It shows all of the 552 and counting undersea cables, which allow very different parts of the world. There's a cable going from Houston, Texas to New Orleans. Or maybe that's Slidell, Louisiana. There's one going from like Sarasota, Florida to Mexico. Interesting. Which allow very different parts of the world to use the exact same internet. There is, of course, a much denser network of wires over land. After all, landlocked countries deserve the internet too but it's nowhere near as interesting to look at. <laughs> Some of the unlikely routes on this map reveal that it's cheaper and faster to lay a sea cable even when a land route is available. Such as these ones that oh, bounce around right. the outside of Africa and South America, this one that goes all the way over the top of Russia, and this one that goes from America to America. The clear, clean and mostly straight lines of this undersea cables map, ignoring Southeast Asia, strikingly show which parts of the world are most interested in which other parts. North America and Europe, for example, have got way more cables connecting them than seemingly necessary, reflecting mm. the huge amount of cross-continental commerce and communication that goes on between them. Whilst data from Australia to South America is happy to take the more scenic <laughs> So it's perhaps no coincidence that this map so strongly resembles maps of major flight paths and shipping lanes. It's also no coincidence that countries with the fewest cable connections tend to be the world's poorest. Just one mm. cable serves the Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea, Sierra Leone and Liberia. But does the number of connections you have, and to whom, actually matter? Wouldn't one cable each be plenty of internet to be going round? Yeah, sadly not. Oh. These cables are susceptible to breakage, due to sabotage from hostile countries, earthquakes, and being eaten by sharks. So it makes sense to have at least a couple of spares. Is that real? Do sharks eat the cables? I have to look it up. I can't tell if it's a joke. Sharks have been witnessed attacking undersea cables. That is so bizarre. Sharks are dumb. I, I love that these guys went through the trouble of getting a shark mask and setting up this shot. Thank you guys 
for going through that. So it makes sense to have at least a couple of spares. In 2022, the Shetland Islands became even more remote when their key cable was shredded by an overzealous fishing boat. I'll tell you who the killer was. It was... Ah, Duncan must be home. More importantly, <laughs> the cables under the sea carry about $10 trillion worth of financial transactions every day. And if those every cables day? fail, nobody will be able to buy pink suitcases, funny hats, teddy bears, or basketballs. Oh, he's listing things that are in the shop window next to the ATM. No wonder. Pretty funny. So if these cables are so completely critical to life in 2023, or whichever year it is where you are, shouldn't we be worried about who actually owns them? Yes, we should, hmm. because increasingly these cables are being built by a very... It was the beginning of the internet. ...small handful of powerful companies. <laughs> Google, Microsoft, and Meta have spent billions of human dollars building their own massive private cables. I didn't know that. And this matters, partly because we all then become dependent on these largely unregulated companies for a crucial piece of 21st century infrastructure. Wow, I could see Google getting into that. I didn't think Microsoft and Meta would get into the nitty-gritty of industrial cabling. But also, can we really be sure these tech giants aren't listening into their fancy hoses to collect yet uh, more of the valuable private data belonging to you and me? With so much <laughs> of our daily technology use now wireless, be it the phone in your pocket or the router in the awkward bit of the drawer next to the TV, it's important to remind ourselves that the internet is not some invisible banana. That is where my router is. How did he know? It's important to remind ourselves that the internet is not some invisible benevolent technology. It still requires physical things, hmm. servers, wires data centers. It's particularly telling that we refer to the mysterious netherworld where all the world's computers connect as the cloud when it's actually on the bottom of the ocean, the opposite of a cloud. Hmm. So next time you send an email, stream a TV show, or listen to the audio only of 20% of an episode of Mat Men with the video minimized in a tab in the background, remember, it's been through a layer of Vaseline. <laughs> Great. Oh, I love these guys. Really good. They take a potentially very boring subject and they make it funny. If you were to ask me before I watched this video, I would have thought that the internet was mostly going over satellites, but we're still using these physical cables, which is kind of crazy, with Vaseline in them. What? A few years ago, I was hired by Google to record some training videos, and I was living in Atlanta at the time, and they had me go to Charleston, South Carolina. The place where we did them was this, there's this giant... I want to say a warehouse, but it's bigger than a warehouse. And most of what was inside of those were tanks of water. So they have the servers and they need all this water to cool down the servers. So every time you type in something to Google, it creates heat and it has to be cooled down with water. That was when I learned that that using the internet, using computers, is you think that it's totally green and not affecting anything in the physical world, but it really is. And now I'm learning that it also requires cables that go under the ocean and get eaten by sharks and contain Vaseline. <laughs> I'm not living in the world that I once thought I was, if that makes sense. Wow, very informative video. Thank you guys for recommending. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Later.